What mechanisms are already in place and what do we still need to build? I'm about to talk to an expert who knows exactly what to do. Craig Jones, Cybercrime Director, Interpol. Craig, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you second year in a row. I'd like to start with this question. Who, in your opinion, collaborates more effectively? Cybercriminals or us, the good guys? Why is it so, in your opinion? Do you think that maybe this year's crisis has affected the situation in any way? So, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me back to uh, Silo Polygon for 2020. It's a great honor to be here. I think taking your question there in two parts on the collaboration side, yes, we do see strong collaboration between cyber criminals. Um, and they do this in a number of different ways through their networks that they build up over time, but also they do it individually. Um, and as criminals, they don't trust each other quite often as well. So sometimes those networks will break down and splinter off. So whilst they may trust each other on the one hand, um, they don't always work that well or collaborate. However, we are seeing them taking more of a business approach to that and treating cybercrime as a business. So that's how they're sort of working collaborating together. On the other hand, then, on the good guys, um, certainly for law enforcement, Interpol having 194 member countries, it's our role here to connect those countries and member countries for a safer world. And effectively, we do that through a number of uh, technological solutions that we have, but also we do more emphasis now on working with public-private partners. And I believe last year I spoke about our public-private partnership arrangements going forward, and we've progressed that even further now. So we keep stepping and coming ahead as well and using those networks which we're developing um, throughout the globe. We also have the expert working groups and also our, our regional working groups with law enforcement heads of national cybercrime units, where we can really get into those situations, discuss matters with them which are impacting and affecting them as well. So, you know, I would say our groups are, are better um, governance around them. Um, we are all sharing information on that global level and seeing that picture. But we have to draw that through from a local level to an international level and then be very aware we share that data and information backwards as well. Craig, what lessons can we take away from this crisis? Do you think that it changed our mindset about sharing information and being more open? I think it, it, it got us to ask quite a lot of questions of ourselves. In any crisis, you have to respond. And if you've practiced to respond to that crisis, the first important takeaway for me. So you can go to the procedures that you've practiced. You've got a good set of team around you with staff that are skilled, but understand what to do in a crisis. When we looked at the corona um, virus crisis, crisis effectively online, we started looking at everything we put in place over the last 12 months. So we had a, a very clear objective for how we were addressing cybercrime globally. And we turned those into a different set of activities that we, we undertook. So first of all, do we understand the threat? What we're seeing as the threat, how did it develop? And actually what we saw in the threat landscape around coronavirus was not so much as a massive spike in cybercrime, but we saw the cyber criminals jumping on the coronavirus theme. So they adapted the, the tools, techniques and procedures that they already use and then turned them into coronavirus effectively online. So effectively there was that virus then online that they were using. We saw a lot of phishing attacks with that theme, a lot of lures on there, a lot of sort of deployments of malware and then ransomware attacks as well. So, you know, the techniques were still the same, but they were using that sort of crisis and, you know, people's interest as well, because naturally a lot of people are online in a crisis. We're all looking, there's that first for information as well. So we might go on to different sites that we may not have gone on to previously. Um, again, those trusted sites, where do we go online to get our information and our data from as well? Yeah, we've all definitely learned a lot from the last three months. Craig, last year at the first Cyber Polygon, you told us about the uh, Interpol's global partnership programs and collaborative initiatives in cybersecurity. I know yet that you've done a lot since then. Can you share us the progress that you've made? Thank you very much. 
much. Yeah, we, we've made some fantastic progress, not just here at Interpol, but also with our member countries, but more importantly, with our private partners. So the first real progress that we had last year was we took a, a resolution to our General Assembly where there's some procedures that we went through, which allowed us to adopt the way that we work with our private partners and ingrain that in our normal working processes. So we have 13 public-private partners who we're enabled to go to and request information from them and again it comes back to us understanding that threat picture first instance so what's the threat what's the risk and then what's the level of harm we then take that information and data we look to combine that with police data sets and using our analysts here but also working very closely with private partners come up with activities where we can support our member countries either in their investigation into cyber criminals so where are the cyber criminals are they specifically in one country Where's the infrastructure? Where are the criminals cashing out? What are the opportunities that we can identify with our private partners to go after those criminals effectively? So that's now been worked on for the last 12 months. We've got some really good practices in place, which we brought in during COVID-19 about virtual meetings directly with the private partners and our expert working groups, looking to develop strategies and themes whereby we could get that information out Firstly, to law enforcement through purple notices. So that's an Interpol notice, not quite a red notice where we look at arresting people, but we expand the, the modus operandi that are being used by cyber criminals. Or also we did an awareness program as well, where we had a number of partners, both public and private, where we had a four week theme of, you know, expanding on the COVID threats that were being faced by the communities and looking to prevent that crime and that criminality taking place and protecting those communities. And that's very much in line with our mandate of reducing the global impact of cybercrime and protecting communities for a safer world. Well, it's great to hear that you've made that much progress. Craig, there are thousands of people watching us right now, top managers, cybersecurity experts, and just everyone who's mindful of cybersecurity. What can you recommend? How can these people protect their businesses and livelihoods? So I think the first thing is what we do in policing. We, we understand that threat and the risk. You know, what are the threats? What are the risks? Do we understand, you know, are we potentially or would the company be a target for cyber criminals? And in all honesty, most companies are effectively. So then how do you then educate your workforce as well about what's happening? How do you anticipate the future challenges as well? So under the COVID-19, lots of people went, you know, working from home. So how did businesses adapt to there? What policies and procedures did they put in place to protect their staff, but also more importantly, to protect their, their systems being compromised. I know a huge amount of work has been done, you know, with the cybersecurity sector, within business as well, to make it as safe as possible. And again, there's that practicing as well, you know, what happens if you have a cyber breach? You know, if you believe there's been a cyber breach, what actions do you first of all take? Because, you know, trying to respond, you know, when a crisis or an incident hits you, if you haven't trained for it, if you're not prepared for it, then it's quite difficult to respond effectively at those times. Craig, one of our viewers has submitted a question online on the website and is curious to know this. What is your highest priority right now? What is the biggest cybersecurity threat that Interpol is focusing on today? So we're still in the midst of the coronavirus, effectively, the online side of that. So that's one of our main focuses there is, is looking at the continuing threats as they evolve from the cyber criminals. So as they move more away, potentially, from the phishing campaigns and go to a more targeted phase, effectively. And that follows normal crime patterns when there is a sort of the, the volume uptake to start with. And then we look more at, well, actually, what are the cyber criminals looking to specifically target? So what are the different sectors that they may go out? after on the back of a coronavirus outbreak. Again, working with our public-private partners in that, that's a big piece of work we're doing. But also backing that up is also our capabilities development program. So that's building out on our global cybercrime program, identifying the capabilities that policing needs to help them fight cybercrime. But also, what are the different areas that we can prevent cybercrime in as well? So it's sort of three main areas that we're following up constantly on at the moment. Thank you, Craig. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Is there anything you'd like to say before we wrap up? 
No, again, you know, we're big supporters of this event. We think it's really, really important at uh, Eventful where people can come together, where we raise that cyber security awareness, how we improve cyber literacy and things like that. So as an opportunity for me to come and speak with, you know, the many thousands of people that are watching this event today and taking part, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you.